Hey, church, welcome to an online worship service. Would you stand up to your feet wherever you are, whether it be in your living room, out on a jog, you're already standing to your feet. In your car, that's right, stand to your feet. Put it on cruise control. Don't do that. That's humor. That's a joke. But I do want you to sing. So, stand up. Get ready to sing. This is my testimony. We learned it around Easter time. Let's sing it together, shall we? Here we go. Come on. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. Yeah. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yeah, my praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony, this is my testimony. Ooh. Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. He started. Yes, I got. We'll finish what he started. This is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'm testified by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Dead to the self, alive in Christ. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe this is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from dead to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony.
belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of Christ in which we stand oh sing Worship team for leading us through another beautiful time of worship. Well, welcome to another ABF online service. We're so glad you could join us wherever you are. We are so glad you're with us. Well, one of the things we like to do is have you text us 9700. We'd love to hear any of your prayer requests or your God stories, your praises. We love to connect with you and hear from you. So please be in contact with us that way. Well, we've got the Caneo Valley Meal Program coming up, and this is just a great opportunity for us as a church to kind of get outside of our walls and serve those that are less fortunate in our area. So that's going to be on Monday, May 10th. And so if you wouldn't mind going onto our website and signing up to drop off one of the food items, that would be super helpful. Thank you.
We've got our Mar Marriage Essentials class that's coming up. That is going to be at 9 a.m. on our campus in the well, and that's Sunday, May 16th. And that's hosted by Dr. and Mrs. Riser. And that's just a great way for you and your spouse to dive deeper into your marriage. So we'd love to see you there as well. Our baby dedication will be on Sunday, May 23rd at 9 a.m. and 1045. So one of those services you're welcome to. We've got an informational meeting about it in the courtyard at 1015 on Sunday, May 16th. So we'd love to have you come and hear a little bit more details what that's all about, uh, what our child dedication is all about. So we'll see you there as well. Our next women's courtyard gathering will be at 6.30 on Monday, May 24th. And what we're going to be doing that evening is celebrating some of the things that we went through at the tea, the tea that was this past Saturday. We're going to be talking about the kingdom assignments and going beyond and serving those that are in our neighborhood. And so we're excited to hear some of your testimonies and stories from that kingdom assignment story. Well, um, one of the things that we do here is we give to the Lord. And so, man, I want to just say thank you for those that give your offering and your tithes. That's just one great way to keep our church going and keeping uh, serving those that are outside and, uh, and around our world. So um, if you wouldn't mind uh, giving online or sending a check-in, we would be super grateful for that. Well, at this time, I just want to pray over our service as Pastor Scott comes up to teach the word this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what you are doing in our body. Thank you for what you are doing with all of our people and just how you are growing us and stretching us through this season. Lord, we want to commit this time to you. We want to invite you to do a work in us. We invite you to stretch us. We invite you to convict us. We in invite you to um, show us your love and your grace in our lives as well. So Lord, we thank you for what you're about to teach us and we pray a blessing over this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, worship team, and thank you, Adrian. Uh, always good to be together here online. I just wanted to thank you just for your faithfulness, staying connected to the church uh, through these online services. And you might notice uh, today we're not uh, having our normal uh, couch crew here. Uh, it was kind of interesting. Josh I had to step away from the office early this afternoon because they had the uh, little fires in Westlake that ap actually happened to be in his backyard. Here's a, a picture of him there. And so he's taken the uh, evening off. It already, uh, even before the shooting of this video, seems like he's in the clear, uh, but never a dull moment living in Southern California. Well, you might make note that our title of our sermon uh, here today is called Worth celebrating. And we're in 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter, thir or chapter 2, verse 13, if you want to uh, be following along with us. But this title of celebrating is something that I think, and as an American, that is something we love to do. We celebrate everything and anything. We actually have very little filter over what is worthy of celebrating. I don't know how I stumbled on this, but I came upon what's called the National Day Calendar. And really, you can scroll through it, and you start to realize almost every single day of 365 days a year is a, a day of something. I was looking through it since Sunday is when we normally gather. On Sunday is Astronomy Day. It's National Lemonade Day. It's International Harry Potter Day. And it's the World Laughter Day. Monday is the National Paranormal Day and the World Press Freedom Day. Tuesday, May the 4th, is National Star Wars Day. Actually, that makes kind of sense. It's also Rhode Island Independence Day. That's important to celebrate. And Foster Care Day. Wednesday is Cinco de Mayo. It's Teacher's Day. It's International Midwives Day and World Portuguese Language Day. We love to acknowledge and celebrate really anything under the sun. I've noticed this exact same thing that's escalated as I've been raising my own kids. When we were growing up, and the only thing that we made a big deal about was actually high school graduation. Like that was like worthy. You got your, uh, your hat and gown, and we made a big deal about that. Now, man, they make a huge deal about every age. It's like, Johnny, we're so proud of you passing from kinder 
on to first grade. Oh, you, you completed fifth grade, congratulations. Eighth grade, that's like next level celebration. In fact, my wife had to go to a, a mandatory parent meeting. She had to pull away from work today in order to go to a mandatory parent meeting to make sure they had to organize what the eighth grade graduation celebration was going to look like. Well, here in our text today, we'll have some fun with recentering our eyes on things actually worth celebrating. Paul does an excellent job of doing a, some filter and moving us back to some things that are worth elevating even present day. Let me pray before we explore this text. Lord Jesus, thanks for this chance to be together in your word. We recognize that's a big deal, that you wrote a book, that you have a message for us, and that we are intended to respond to your word. We invite you to do the things that you do when we open it and we study it, that you meet us exactly where we're at. Uh, we invite that in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who we depend on for our forgiveness, for our future hope, really for everything. We submit this to you now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So starting in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, you always know where we're going to pick up because it starts right where we uh, ended last week. Verse 13 He's talking, as you know, to this young church in Thessalonica. He says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers." So he starts the section with what they thank God constantly for. Remember I mentioned a few weeks ago that doesn't mean they're in a constant state of chant thanking God, but instead it comes to their minds often. When they think of them, this is what they celebrate. This is a big deal. This verse I would suggest is really a, a key verse in this section. We could spend our entire time here. He realizes that something important about these people, about these young believers. Reality is the way that we operate in life, whether we recognize it or not, is we all move towards something as our truth source, our source of truth. And many, as you know, gravitate towards human wisdom, the collective wisdom of men, as their source of truth. Whatever science has come up with, that's what we're moving towards. Whatever man through his intellectual effort has combined and come to that conclusion, that's what so often is our truth source. I would say this last year, if there's ever a year in human history that's shocked us at the number of cracks in human wisdom Man, it exposed so much in the COVID election year we've just been th through. If anything, we've collectively lost our minds is what I would suggest. Human wisdom has fallen by the wayside and been exposed for the poor source of truth that it is. Another source of truth that some lean towards is kind of a, a, a best of, a, a collection of truth from different sources. And one of those sources may even be God's word. Where they elevate scripture, they say, man, there's some things in there that I really cling to and I think are, are important principles to grab hold of. But yet, even that person is unwilling to acknowledge that it is their truth source. It's a source out of many sources of truth. They still like to play the role of God where they determine which things in it are acceptable and which things they're going to resist. If it doesn't feel good, if they have something in their life that conflicts with it, they're not willing to embrace it as truth. Well, what Paul is celebrating with these young believers is a third group. Those who understood that the words that Paul spoke were directly from God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed. In other words, this, God spoke through people 
as his mouthpieces, the message that he wanted to get across to, man, to mankind, he worked through different authors through history to communicate the message he wanted to be our guide, the direction that we take. And here's the thing about something that's really genuinely accepted as a truth source. It's not something that you debate with. It's not something that you argue with. In fact, if you disagree with it, you need to change your mind. You don't need to change what it says. So many are tempted to do that with God's word. Well, this group of young believers had recognized this is directly from God. I like how he said it. You accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. When you start to realize that that's what it is, that elevates when you're in the word. This should be a priority. When you hear it being spoken of, your ears should perk up. When you're thinking about how you should spend your time and you're like, well, should I be in God's word? Man, this should be elevated because the creator of the universe spoke through men to get this message across to us. That's why as a church family, we elevate it as a priority. That's why it should be transforming us. Do you see what it says there? It says, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. You see, when you really do adopt it as your truth source, it starts to work in you, it starts to transform you, it starts to change you from the inside out. You can't call it your truth source when it doesn't actually influence you because there's so many things in it that calls you to go the opposite direction, to be countercultural, if you will, based on our series. I loved getting an email this week from a, a, a senior saint in our church that she was explaining that she had had a chance to see the video last week, and she really felt convicted as we were talking about discipleship. She's like, man, I felt convicted, and I'm going to elevate my intentionality with discipling one of my children that needs some, some attention. I, I, I love that, that she had an encounter with God's word, and now the response is that it's moving her to action. That's the intent when something is your truth source, that it's at work in you if you're actually a believer. So that's the first thing celebrating here in the text is appropriately elevating scripture. Look as we continue what else is celebrated in verse 14. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed bo both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displeased God, and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always, to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last." Ooh, pretty intense section here, but the first thing I wanted to identify is what he is celebrating first. He describes them. He says, you became imitators. Christianity has always been something that's passed on by example. It's not something that's just talked about. It's something that's lived out and somebody observes somebody living it out. It's a, a model, an example to follow. That's, if you think about it, really often how we learn best. I heard a pastor talking about that this week with learning how to ski, and that's the, my story as well. I first learned to ski by watching my Canadian wife navigate the hills of Canada. I call her Canadian, being from Canada. I remember a trip that we did early on in marriage. We were up in Banff and Jasper and Lake Louise. The Rocky Mountains extend into Canada and really make uh, Colorado look like foothills. You get up there and just the, the scope and magnitude are unbelievable. Well, she, I told her, well, I've skied a little bit in Illinois. Well, Illinois, you have to understand skiing is this. Basically, they've converted trash dump hills into ski hills. And you're like, that doesn't count as skiing. So when she took me for the first time to the, the top of, of uh, Banff, this, this mountain in Banff, I was like, man, I, I can't get down this. So I had to carefully watch how she did it side to side. And even some parts of the hill, she still gives me a hard time about this. I had to use her as, as physical brakes going in front of me. You see this example that's set is the way that you learn best. Now I'm able to somewhat get down 
a hill as we've skied quite a few times since then. Christianity, the same thing is worthy of being celebrated when it works the way it's supposed to work. Those that have been following the Lord for a season are models for those that are newer to following the, following the Lord. And so here in this example, Paul is celebrating that they have followed other churches that are further along. They've taken their example and they've run with it. And here's the thing that I, I think it's more than just the example that is, is his emphasis of celebration. It's the example in which they followed. He says that they suffered the same things. They were willing to persevere with the gospel despite significant opposition from unbelieving Jews. Remember back in chapter one, Paul was celebrating some of the things that they were doing well. He said that they were sounding forth with the gospel in the region. So they, they would show up to a new space and they didn't even have to say anything because the message that had, had radiated out of this church in Thessalonica, that's worthy of celebrating, but that didn't come without some cost. They had to endure, they had to endure uh, suffering because of that. They received opposition. And who does he say the opposition came from? Pretty intense section there. He points out specifically the opposition coming from the Jews and what they had done. They had killed Jesus and the prophets. Now, upon first reading, you're like, man, uh, did we forget to include the fact that there was Roman involvement there, that our sins put them on the cross, any of that? Well, Paul was able, not being anti-Semitic, he's not doing that. He's able to point out some flaws and some shortcomings with his own people. So he's not, he's not trying to abuse them or mistreat them with his words here. He's not letting them off the hook though, either. Paul cared for them deeply. In fact, if you read Romans 9, three through five, he describes speaking about his, his willingness that he would trade his salvation for their rescue. Every time he went to a new region, that was the first people group that he tried to minister to was the Jews. He elevated them, but he didn't let them off the hook. I think that's an important thing to, to understand. So often we think when we speak of, of coming judgment or, or pending wrath, we a lot of times in today's day and age, we associate that as, as, that, as not being loving or compassionate. But the truth is, Sometimes that warning is the most compassionate thing somebody can possibly do is to say, man, this is coming. And so he's writing to this audience. He's not saying literally that every Jew will receive judgment because even some of his audience have been rescued and saved because of their trust in Jesus Christ. But he doesn't let them off the hook from the same judgment that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 23, 31 through 38, pending judgment that's already some of it been experienced. If you look at the history of Israel, whether it was the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD or the nearly 2,000 years of hardness of hearts or more recently the horror of the Holocaust where millions have been slaughtered by Hitler. He makes reference to pending judgment because he loves them and cares about them and desperately wants to see them turn. But I don't want to take us too far off the track from what really I believe this section is celebrating. And what it's celebrating is the fact that this young group of believers didn't alter their attempts to share the gospel because of opposition. I remember when Adrian and I were in seminary, we ended up taking quite a few evening classes together because uh, we were both working full time while we're doing that. Remember, there's one guy that was in one of our classes, actually pretty consistently in our classes. And I'll be honest with you, not this maybe sounds mean, but he's a little bit odd of a, of a fella. But I, I, I liked it. We were downtown Chicago in this guy as he came to class every single day, he had a big billboard sign cut out that had words on the front and on the back that he wore on the subway coming and going to class. And if I remember correctly, all it said was Jesus loves you so much. Jesus loves you so much. 
He's thinking about that, how many times he must have been made fun of and ridiculed in his, on his ride back and forth. But yet, despite the opposition, he was committed. Maybe what we might think is maybe not the best approach for reaching out, but that in his heart, that was his way of expressing how much people were loved. Persevering with the gospel is something worthy of celebrating whatever form it takes in your life. Verse 17 will continue second uh, half of this passage. Really a couple other things that you see celebrated. Verse 17 says, But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. There's a popular expression in our day that we use fairly often or hear it used fairly often. Somebody will say this, I couldn't care less. Basically the idea is unless something directly affects me, I'm not really too concerned about it. It's kind of the the byproduct of the society in which we live that kind of centers around me. So if something isn't involved with me, I'm not too concerned about it. Thankfully, when we talk about being countercultural and following Jesus' example, that's not the case for believers. What we have to offer to the world around us, what we have to offer is genuine care. We see this with Paul's affection for these new converts. He genuinely wanted to be with them. He says, even though we haven't been together for just a short time, it's like they're still deeply missed. He describes it as feeling like they were torn away. You remember me telling you about him having to leave or sneak off in the middle of the night. So it would have really felt like he was torn away in the middle of a, a friendship or relationship that he had with these young believers. Imagine that when you're torn away from family. Got me thinking this week just about times or seasons that I've been apart for family for extended periods of time. I remember like it was yesterday, the first day that my parents and my sisters, they weren't on the drive, but dropped me off at Cedarville University for the very first time. It was going to be the very first time in all of my years that I'd lived away from my family. And I tried to put on a tough guy face like it wasn't that big of a deal. But I remember when they drove off, man, tearing up. It was was hard to be away from family, from people that you care about that have been so dear to you for so long. This is the description that Paul has for his these young believers. He genuinely missed them. It says that he had a deep desire to be with them. How? Face to face. Face to face. In this past year of COVID, I hope that that's been something to some degree that's bothered us during the seasons that we haven't been able to be together. That there's a, a deep longing where you're just like, man, I just miss being together with these people face to face. That's what happens when we operate as the church in which God designed, that we're family and family doesn't like to be apart. For some of us, I would hope that if there hasn't been that strain or that difficulty in being apart, that you maybe have to revisit and check yourself. Maybe I'm not leaning into the church to the degree in which it was designed. It was designed to be a a family doing life together. If you're not leaning in, then all of a sudden being away isn't such a big deal. Paul demonstrates that it should be. He models that. And the truth is, the enemy recognizes that when we come together to strengthen and encourage each other, man, we're much stronger. But when you're separated from the fold, that leaves us quite vulnerable, quite vulnerable. I end up watching my share of nature videos over the years. And I find myself in some of these nature videos actually cheering for the wrong animal. Because a lot of times when a a lion is hunting something, what do they always go after? They always go after the the youngest of the the herd that often of whatever animal it is that's kind of drifted away from the group, the most vulnerable one out of the mix. And they kind of separate it from the fold and then it's easy prey. The same concept is true here, and he understands it for the enemy to get a hold of us. So he's trying to take this young church and separate them from their leader. 
I was watching a, a movie, where, actually a, a series this past fall with Adrian. It's called The Queen's Gambit. I don't know if you had a chance to see this. It's about a young chess protege. It was pretty impressive, this young girl's ability to play chess. And you got pretty sucked into it because she just had an unbelievable mind. It was a, a fictitious story, but I know there's other examples of similar chess players over the years. The more you study God's word, the more you start to realize the overlap to God, between God's word and the game of chess. You're like, okay, pastor, what, what do you mean by that? What I would suggest, I would propose what we see in scripture is that really every single person is being moved by something. Either the Lord is directing your steps, moving you from this place to this place or this place, or as we see here, the enemy, Satan himself, is moving you from this place to this place to this place. From human perspective, it would have just seemed like his opposition was a Jewish non-believers that resisted the gospel. You would have said, yeah, that's, that's what he's described. He just talked about it in the previous couple of verses. But from a spiritual perspective, Paul recognized that the opposition, even though it took the form of humans, was Satan moving things behind the scenes. That's why it's so critical to have a deep care for others because it compels you to move past that, to, to push back despite the resistance. I love it because you think about this, the enemy, Satan would have thought, man, this church is doomed. I'm able to separate them from their leader, from the impact that Paul's going to have them. I've forced him literally hundreds of miles away. But think about the resolve that came across Paul. He said, all right, hand me a pen, hand me a pen. And because of that resolve, we're still a couple thousand years later, still being blessed by his words by, that were penned to this young group of believers. You see, that was compelled by deep care and compassion for others, and it's still something that's worth it today, that should be celebrated today, is a care and compassion. You cannot have any kind of influence and impact in anyone's life unless it's naturally compelled by care, unless the Holy Spirit does a, a work in your life and your heart in elevating others' needs above your own. We'll end with these last couple verses, verse 19 and 20. One other thing that you see is worthy of celebration. It says this in 19, says, for what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. In his first couple of words there, he asks a really important question that I think is important for each of us to ask. He says, what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus? In other words, this, when the Lord returns, and it's not if the Lord returns, the question is when the Lord returns, what of your things, what of your pursuits, what of your hopes is actually worth it? What actually should be on your, on your mind? What should be on your heart? Is it to, is like, what's, what's important to you? Is it my crypto portfolio? Is it my zip code? Is it my company size? Is it my vacation destinations? What is it? What is our hope? What's going to actually matter? As Paul is getting older, he's reflecting on some of these things. And he's considering what actually matters. Transformed lives. That's what matters. When it's all said and done, the one thing that's going to matter isn't what you've accomplished in your job or what, how you've moved up the ranks or your success in the business world or your financial portfolio. All of that's going to be fleeting. What's going to last and matter for the next 100,000 years and beyond is transformed lives. Lives that have been impacted by your life. That's the reality of it. 
I had the opportunity to reconnect with a really good friend this week. My, really, I'd say one of my best friends in life, Joe Basil, who's a pastor up in Fresno. He's actually gotten to be a guest speaker here before. He's a pastor and just has a real heart for evangelism. It's kind of cool. Anytime I spend time with him and hear stories of influence and all the different adventures the Lord has him on, to be reminded of the fact that he got to be introduced to Jesus Christ because of my friendship with him, because of our family's influence in his life and ultimately bending a knee and turning his life over to Jesus Christ. You think about that amplify the influence that he's had on so many different lives. When this is all said and done, when we uh, wade through all the priorities that we had in our life, the one crown of boasting that's worthy of anything is going to be the influence we had on others. Crown of boasting could be interpreted just like, what, isn't boasting a, a bad thing? Crown of boasting is this idea of a, a crown of a, a garland that would be put on a victor's head after a competition. If they succeeded, you've maybe seen some of the early Olympic games that they'd have kind of this crown that the winner got to wear. Well, here's the reality that scripture describes so often. It's not just a, a theme or an a, a, a idea up in the air. It's actually a reality that there will be crowns divvied out based on the influence and impact that our lives, uh, lives have had on others. So that's why, why Paul is diligent to say, man, I'm trying to win as many as possible. Imagine when we're worshiping in eternity to have no crowns to lay at the feet of Jesus. That's what is worth celebrating. So as you're reflecting on your days and the priorities and all of these different tugs of things that should be celebrated Man, Paul brings us back to what's actually worth celebrating. Those that have elevated scripture as their truth source. Those that are persevering with the gospel despite opposition. Those that have a deep care for others and ultimately transformed lives. That's what's worthy of celebration. I want to end just as we go into this last song, just with a, a moment of quiet for you to just reflect and ask yourself some questions. Sometimes I feel like we can just blaze through another sermon, not really reflect on what needs to adjust as you encounter this section of God's word. What priority needs to be moved or altered? And so I just want to give a moment of just quiet just before I pray for you to ask some of those questions, even in these moments now. Lord Jesus, we love to celebrate, as I mentioned as we started this message. But God, I ask that you would bring us back to the right priorities, the things that should be celebrated, influence and impact, changed lives, those that we see being transformed in what their source of truth is. God, we ask that you would help us to realign our priorities to align with your priorities, the things that should be celebrated in this life. We recognize we can't do any of this apart from your transforming work in our lives. We're dependent on that fully. So we ask for that, even in these moments, going into that, this last song. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Oh! 
church family. Well, hopefully you've been encouraged by this chance to be in the Word. And I always encourage you to spend some time in that text yourself. Go over, read through it, see what God might want to nudge you towards. You want it to have the, the impact that it was designed to have. Any way we can serve you this week, always feel free to reach out. Otherwise, God bless you. Have an amazing day.